Right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event with Dr. Richard Maharaj. Uh, the event, the presentation titled The Tear Film, A Superhero in All of Us. I'll be your host tonight, Dr. Ariel Sorenzi. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Richard Maharaj. He is the Director of Interventional Dry Eye Services. And we were talking a little bit about his practice before this. And he has um, two practices in the vicinity of Toronto where he focuses on dry eye all day, every day, and that's 100% of his patients. So it's really awesome to hear from somebody that is just absolutely in the thick of it and specializes it. And we are so excited to learn from all of your expertise today. So I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you for, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you very much, Ariel. I appreciate the, uh, the intro and going through the fun stuff about housekeeping. So, so tonight uh, we're taking off from, uh, I guess, the previous parts of the series. Uh, if anybody in the audience is a, a Marvel fan, you know, you kind of have to have seen all 10 Marvel movies before you can watch Endgame. I don't think that's necessarily the case with this lecture tonight. However, if you caught Dr. Madan and Dr. Eltis's uh, talk last week, some of the concepts that they discussed I will review and kind of uh, go over very briefly, but I think it helps to have seen that. And if you haven't seen their uh, talk from last week, I think it would certainly uh, be worth a review because I echo some of the uh, info that they've gone through. So these are my disclosures that have already been listed uh, in the previous slide. Uh, as it pertains to tonight, <clears throat> uh, I don't have anything to uh, fully disclose. So really what I want to go through over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes or so is um, just kind of understanding, you know, our current understanding of the tear film anatomy. And when I say current, I mean, you know, it really has evolved. And I want to kind of dive a little bit further into it. Um, and I also want to explore patient subtypes. So we all have our typical kind of dry patient that we have forged in our brain. Um, as it turns out that there are sort of uh, different categories of patient subtypes that we can isolate and identify in our practices. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take certain treatment strategies and pair them with these different patient subtypes. So I really wanna to try to combine you know, the evidence-based um, approach to the practical-based approach. I do, as, as Ariel has mentioned, I do practice uh, purely in the ocular surface space. Um, I run the uh, prime, uh, excuse me, the PRISM uh, dry centers in the Toronto area. Uh, and we are the largest provider of dry services in Canada. So we're fortunate to, and you know, lucky really to be able to manage um, this volume of dry eye. And uh, from that, I've, I've sort of gleaned a couple of things which I'd love to share with everybody here. So <clears throat> before we jump right in, I just wanna kind of pose these, these questions just to get your frame of mind uh, into, the right, uh, into the right zone. I want everybody to think about how do you approach managing dry eye and what are your biggest challenges in general in this space. I also want you to consider if you have been practicing, what were the easiest hurdles for you to overcome? What were the smallest hills for you to climb, the largest hills for you to climb? Um, also, you know, within those easier hurdles, did you have no issue with figuring out how to diagnose the patient, how to treat them? Or, you know, perhaps it was just literally the practice management side of things running a parallel dry clinic with your, your general practice. Maybe that was an issue or an easy overcoming hill. Um, and then finally, given the amount of ECPs in North America, you know, I want you to all consider why is it that there isn't a completely uniform approach? If you go from practice to practice next door, you're going to find quite a lot of variance between uh, colleagues. And why might that be? So having these different thoughts in your head tonight, I really want to set the stage um, because depending on what your answers to these, you actually may find some elements more interesting or more applicable to what it is that you want to capture. And so for this conversation tonight, I really do cover quite a swath uh, of subject areas. I do try to distill it into useful and practical approaches, but, uh, but do be mindful of, of what you want to glean from this and, and, and capture that as best possible. So... Uh, I really love this video and there's no other purpose other than just to, uh, to show you guys something cool. This is from uh, uh, an IG account at Cinematogra uh, and we're looking at 28,500 frames per second of this drop 
running into an eye. And you can really get a sense of how exquisite and, and, and fantastic it is to see how it actually stays on an eye and how it's almost like, you know, watching uh, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, and it's this, I love, I actually have this, sometimes I show this to my patients when they say, did they get the drop in my eye? And I can kind of show them, well, you probably did, but a lot of it splashes around there. So what does this have to do with, with, with the modern ocular surface anatomy? So we've all heard uh, at nauseum probably the different areas, excuse me, the different layers of the tear film, the mucin layer, the aqueous layer, and the lipid layer. And uh, I'll often repeat this to my patients um, and, and, and really kind of lay it out for them. In fact, I'll do this with every patient, whether they're new or old. And I'll remind them that there are these three distinct layers and they all have to work in perfect synchrony uh, in order for things to really work properly. So I'll talk to them about the fact that the mucin layer and the aqueous layer are actually interconnected as a mucoaqueous and the mucin anchors that tear film onto the corneal surface. And then the lipid layer comes in and finishes it off by giving a nice slick top surface so that the rest of the tear doesn't evaporate. But I'll go even further, which is to jump into the fact that it's more complex than just a simple three layers of tears. In fact, there's over 2000 molecules uh, most recently that we know of um, that are in the tear film. And of those 2000 molecules, a lot of those are you know, proteins, metabolites, um, and, and biologically active growth factors like nerve growth factor, um, transforming growth factor beta, epidermal growth factor, to name a few. These are pretty critical. Transforming growth factor beta is responsible for maintaining clarity or wound healing. Nerve uh, growth factor is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the subbasal nerve plexus. Um, so we all have, we have these sort of complex constituents and it's very much akin to our bloodstream for the rest of our body. I explained to our patients that our cornea is avascular and our tear film is basically our eyes local immunity. So we need to preserve that, we need to support it and we need to continuously look after that. And it's only then when I paint that picture to a lot of my patients, they kind of take a step back and think, oh wait, it's not just a teardrop that I need to put in my eye. What else do I need? And so they're sort of primed and ready for the rest of the consult. But I always set the stage with that message first. Um, now, pairing the structural components of the tear film anatomy, we also have the back office, right? What's the operating system look like? And that's a lacrimal functional unit. Okay. And so the LFU, which is the nervous system, essentially, or the neurosensory component, which is controlling both the production and monitoring the outflow of tears at any given time. And it's through this combination of structure and function that we're able to get, like I said, this exquisite balance on the surface. In fact, it's almost a, a wonder that it even works at all. So on the lacrimal functional side, we have our trigeminal parasympathetic nervous system, which is contributing to the regulation of homeostasis, regulation of that balance that we're trying to achieve on the surface. But then we also have the, the sympathetic pathways that modulate tear flow and, and composition. And a lot of that uh, sympathetic nervous system actually happens through the nasal cavity. So when we start to think about the breadth of, of uh, tear film control, uh, it becomes more obvious to the patient that, again, a simple a unitary uh, uh, solution just can't exist, or if it does exist, we just haven't found it yet. So we do have to look at these different factors. Further than that, when you put the structure and the function together, you come up with an immunological response, okay? And so Dr. Perriman, Laura, great friend of mine, a wonderful colleague, and just a hoot to learn from um, uh, her and, and Dr. Perez, Victor Perez and Daniel Sabin, uh, and their group, they put together a wonderful paper in 2020, which I lean on heavily uh, and I love. And I think it really explains um, what may happen in a dry cycle. So we have an, a, a regulated adaptive response, uh, immune response, which essentially begins with some sort of triggering event that may be, um, you know, a, a contact lens in the eye, a, a cosmetic exposure, uh, an infection, surgery, uh, you name it, some sort of triggering event that triggers the loss of homeostasis on the surface. And that triggering event will then result in amplification of the T cells, recruitment, and further reactivation of T cells. And if everything goes properly in the regulated adaptive system, there is a resolution to that, that problem. 
Uh, now the resolution, actually there's an article that came out in Nature earlier this year that actually may point to a, a class of proteins called resolvins, which may actually have a function there. The assumption that the immune response will resolve on its own may in fact be a false assumption. We'll wait and see what the science shows us. But until that time, the dysregulated adaptive uh, system in the dry eye patient will be, again, that triggering event, that amplification, that recruitment and reactivation, but there is no resolve in the system. And unfortunately, without that resolve, the vicious circle of dry eye ensues. Okay. And so, again, I try to explain this to our patients. Essentially, your tear film is constantly trying to heal itself and the tissues it covers. And if that healing mechanism is damaged in any way, then we have to figure out where those, those weaknesses may lie. Okay. So that's what I would consider to be the modern ocular surface anatomy. It's not just lipid, mucin, and aqueous, it's structure, it's function, it's immunological. Those three factors come into play. So let's look at these different uh, dry patient subtypes. Okay. So I am a, a superhero fan of the genre big time. Uh, this is going back, but I'm using the Superman visual analog scale to describe uh, uh, the look on my patient's faces, depending on which group they fall into. So we have our episodic patient, our chronic patient, and our recalcitrant patient. So this is actually pulled from a what I think is a, a wonderful uh, uh, supplement uh, in the CJO. This is from 2014, and it's very applicable even today <clears throat> in breaking down our patients into these different categories. And so I'm going to jump into these categories. I'm going to talk about how we identify them and also suggest some treatment par paradigms that um, that really work well uh, in managing these cases. So the episodic patient, okay? And so these are typically of a younger demographic, maybe under 24 in that younger zone. I'm certainly not 24, so this doesn't apply to me. I can say younger. Um, these patients may or may not be contact lens wearers. Their symptoms are typically mild. If you're measuring validated symptoms or dry questionnaire, maybe between a six and an 11, if they're on a speeds questionnaire, it's probably between a four and a seven. Um, and again, these are, these are sort of general windows. Don't stay within these goalposts. It, it's, a, it's a bit nuanced, but these are suggested windows. Their signs are, again, variable, but they're subtle. And in many cases, they can be overseen if you're not looking for them closely. Right, And so this is the reason why I recommend a validated questionnaire, because that may tip you off into looking a little bit more closely for these clinical signs like trace corneal conjunctival staining, or just a slight reduction into your breakup time, maybe it's seven or eight seconds. Um, if you're measuring osmolarity, good for you, number one. Uh, but if you are measuring osmolarity, you may not get a hyperosmolar reading of above 306. However, if you're measuring on multiple occasions, you may find that you're getting a lot of variability. Osmolarity, uh, in my opinion, is very similar to blood sugar, right? So it's not just in a diabetic patient, we're not just looking for an A1C that's elevated uh, or a fasting glucose excuse me, that's elevated. We're looking for a stable uh, A1C. So in osmolarity, if we can measure it in real time, second after second after second, you're going to find in a dry population that it regulates very quickly. So it stays within a very narrow band, right? The standard deviation is very small. Whereas in a dry patient, you're gonna find that there's a lot of variance. But all we do is we measure one time and one time only, and if that's the information we're going on, you'll have to measure repeatedly to see if there is variance across, uh, across visits. The episodic patient will also present with a very specific, or typically will present with a very specific onset. They'll usually say something to the effect that, oh, I went out one night and I left my contact lens in and I've had dry eye ever since. This was six months ago. And that's what caused it. And they are certain that that's what caused it, even though you, as their clinician, know otherwise. Um, and so, again, this episodic patient, most of the time, treatment involves managing their environment, uh, managing their lifestyle habits, digital habits, et cetera. Um, so some clinical pearls as to what to look for, you really want to focus on the eyelash and lid margin, um, and specifically talking about blepharitis and lid wiper epitheliopathy. So here's an example of blepharitis. Now, prior to, to focusing on dry eye specifically as a full-time specialty service, uh, in primary care, I'll be honest, when I was a new grad, I would look at a case like this and I'd say, I think you might have some baby shampoo somewhere in the house. Go reach for it and scrub those lids and that should do it. 
Well, we now know a lot better, and I certainly wouldn't let a lid like this walk away without uh, actively managing it, but we're looking for signs of demodex, which would be cylindrical dandruff. Uh, and you're also noticing sort of that pearly, uh, shiny, glossy uh, uh, surface covering there, which is an uh, example of, uh, of, of staph. And so we look at lids like this now in my clinic, and we don't let them walk away without proper management. Um, similarly, we look for cosmetic debris. This patient told me and swore by it that the last time she wore makeup was, I think, a week and a half ago. And again, swore that she scoured her lids and there's no residue whatsoever. Everybody now knows, looking at this image, that that couldn't be furthest from the truth. Uh, and there was this refractile debris that lingered. Um, and she was shocked by it, but not surprised. Um, again, these are cases where I'm going to recommend and remind the patient about their you know, cosmetic use and talk to them about uh, safety of cosmetic use, proper uh, cosmetic removal, et cetera. And also remind them again that this may be one of those triggers that can insult the surface of the eye and break down the balance that we're trying to achieve. It's also important to stain and look at the interior. Okay, so what does the bulbar and palpebral conjunctiva look, for, look like? Specifically, the uh, just posterior to the line of marks, the lid wiper uh, region on the palpebral conjunctiva, you're looking for that thick band of staining. So that thick band of staining represents lid wiper epitheliopathy. Um, and that is very commonly found in symptomatic contact lens wearers and about 80% of symptomatic contact lens wearers. It does uh, show up more so in younger populations with very, very tight lids. So if the anatomy is very tight, very taut, and there are contact lens wear, you're more likely to have some friction being induced, which will induce that lid wiper change. Similarly, in patients that have poor apposition and loose lids and poor, uh, uh, and, uh, poor elasticity, you're also going to notice that exposure may induce lid wiper. Regardless, the lid wiper region is adjacent to the meibomian gland orifice and to the soft tissues surrounding it, which are very sensitive to inflammation. So invariably, if we see these two findings, blepharitis or lid wiper, there's a very high probability that the meibomian glands are involved, or if they're not already, they're going to be soon. So these patients need some attention. So what kind of attention do we want to give them? Well, again, on the left-hand side of your screen, I've made some suggestions as to how to counsel them uh, and also how to triage them. But we also want to be mindful of any particular surgery that they may have had, uh, medications that they might be on, diuretics, antihistamines, uh, comorbid. In this population, they're younger, they're not likely to be on glaucoma drops, but that can be the case. But we're going to actively implement the treatment that is uh, preventative in nature. So we really want to focus on, in my opinion, non-preserved lubricants. And as the market has shifted, we really have a, 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 wide, a much wider range of non-preserved lubricants that is easily accessible for patients. In Canada, that's certainly been the case. And I know that there's a growing a uh, number of those options in the United States. Hyaluronate is one of my favorite polysaccharides. It's a molecule that we use a lot as a hydrating agent on uh, skincare products. Well, much the same can be said of uh, hyaluronate on the eye. Not all hyaluronate are the same, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. For lid hygiene, we want to focus on uh, uh, not anti-infective, but more of an antiseptic approach. So we want to have tea tree oil-based cleansers, which are effective at reducing staph and demodex populations, um, hyperchlorous, which is again effective at being antibacterial, um, and the newer classes of uh, anti-demodectal and antibacterial, uh, one such option is called zocular, which contains an ochre extract, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But these are excellent and very effective uh, therapies. Just one quick note about tea tree oil. I know that there have been some bench studies that have come out in the previous year looking at tea tree oil and its impact on meibomian gland cell uh, uh, in vitro. And I really uh, uh, would recommend, you know, exercising caution and in jumping on the tea tree oil is bad bandwagon because it's not actually the case that that study was uh, particularly focused on um, uh, lab work and it doesn't necessarily translate to what we see clinically. I've been using tea tree oil based products for over a decade and I've yet to see a deleterious effect. Um, in the case where a patient is coming in, an episodic patient is coming in with a flare, we'll certainly have to reach for a steroid. Isuvis in the United States is on label, um, but we may reach for, in Canada, other options. Um, if it's a mild case, 0.25 BID for two weeks, 
more moderate cases, we're going to go 0.5 BID for two weeks. Oftentimes, BID for two weeks is sufficient. Certainly, you can titrate that up should the need arise. The pearl here for treating is you want to focus again on prevention, right? Education goes a long way, but also take proactive steps at reducing evaporative triggers, monitoring their screen time, talking about cosmetic health, uh, and recognizing uh, flare up. More importantly, dictating that recognition to the patient. What do they need to look for? How do they identify it at home? When should they or shouldn't they worry? So quickly, how do we decide what drops to use? Well, there was a study, a paper that was published last year in 2021 uh, in the spring. And this paper sought to discover um, or to study the rheological behavior of some commercial artificial tier solutions. So this is very much an evidence-based approach to kind of analyzing uh, various non-preserved agents on the market. And when studying the rheological behavior, and rheology is basically the study of the physics of fluids, uh, the, the authors discovered that there were actually three distinct categories of artificial lubricants. And again, these lubricants studied, there was about 20, not about, there were 20 uh, solutions studied uh, that were available in both Canadian and UK markets. Uh, just as a point of order, I'll show you those in a moment. Uh, but some of these uh, solutions are available by other names in the United States, and many of them are going to be coming to the United States in the near future. But the classes of um, drops that were kind of uh, dissected were categories A, B, and C that you're looking at your screen here. Um, and the feature is really represented their, their viscosity and their ability to change in viscosity depending on the forces of a blink. So let me go into that a little bit. When your eye blinks, when the eye closes, on an open eye, there's a very low amount of force being exerted. As the eye begins to close, there's an increasing amount of force. We call that shear force that's being applied. And then finally, when the eye squeezes and closes and is about to open, maximum force is applied and then released. What we want on the eye is a solution that starts off with high viscosity, goes through what we call a shear thinning process where it becomes less and less viscous. Finally, it gets to its minimum viscosity, and then most importantly, it snaps back to high viscosity. So an example of a non-Newtonian fluid like that would be cornstarch and water. If your kids, if you have kids and they make slime, chances are they're using cornstarch and water at some point. That is a non-Newtonian fluid. Water is a Newtonian fluid. It has consistent viscosity regardless of the forces being applied. So those were the spectrums that were discovered. And <clears throat> you can see the, the uh, uh, distinct um, rheological profile of these various categories, category A, B, and C, figure one, two, and three, respectively. So that's how they behave when forces are applied. Well, how is this relevant for choosing an artificial tier? What does this mean? Well, what I discovered, and this is again over the last 10 years, by the way, if you're taking a screenshot, this is a good one because this dictates the uh, different categories that were uh, analyzed in the study. So when we look at our patients, whether they're evaporative or aqueous, and we know that the majority of them have an evaporative component, we can start to look at drops that mimic this rheological profile of the nature, natural tear. In fact, the lipid layer is highly non-Newtonian. It has that distinct curvature that I showed you in the graphs before. So we're more likely to reach for a drop found in category A. That being said, if we have a surface, an ocular surface, that is irregular. Maybe there's EBMD or there's conjunctival chalasis, or you name it. We're going to want one that has a rheological profile that is more like a Newtonian solution, that is more like water. So a flat line, that's more like a category C. As you would imagine that no patient is exactly the same as the other, and more often than not, we do need to mix and match. So how do we mix and match? What are some other considerations that we use in choosing these, these solutions? Well, triolose, triolose is actually a, a disaccharide and I love polysaccharides. Um, it's a disaccharide that is uh, found in non-mammalian species that are survived osmotically unfavorable environments for, for, gen for decades. And um, it's through the vehicle of cell membrane modulation that triolose in particular has its efficacy. So there's a number of papers. In fact, triolose has been published uh, in DUCE 2 and, and, and been published numerous times in its efficacy in uh, increasing the retention time of tear on eyes, decreasing uh, biomarker uh, concentrations on eye, and uh, certainly affecting uh, symptomatic uh, patients uh, statistically significant levels. In particular, one study that I kind of focus in on um, 
demonstrated that after two months of treatment, um, there was also a significant impact on goblet cell density. And while I haven't stressed it enough, the goblet cells are really the unsung heroes of the tear film uh, and the tear system, I should say. I know that lipid layer and my bone gland dysfunction, you know, it's, it's a sexy time of the day to talk about my bone gland dysfunction and all the different treatments, but the unsung heroes, the quiet, the quiet rumble in the background is coming from the goblet cells. And by reducing uh, uh, goblet cell density, we're actually taking away the infrastructure, the scaffolding of the tear film. So any solution that helps to preserve goblet cell function, I'm a huge fan of. So going back to the categories, so as I said, on the spectrum of dry eye, we know that it's not a binary solution as uh, Dr. Altus and Dr. Medan talked about last session. We know that on this spectrum, as the patient tends more towards the evaporative component, I lean towards a category A. As they tend towards an aqueous component, I tend to lean towards a category uh, C. Now, when we're thinking about biochemical considerations, the more inflammatory signs I see on the eye, and that can be MMP9, osmolarity, uh, corneal or conjunctival staining, the more likely I'm going to reach for a drop that contains a polysaccharide, like Trelos or Thalos Duo, for instance, in Canada. Um, and it's this consideration that I'm just going to pause on for a moment, because I'm, I guarantee that there is at least one person, perhaps many, of the 1,600 or so that are online, that has reached for lefitigras and Restasis to manage a dry patient. You've prescribed two medicines. What I would suggest is, why is it that we think that there should be one single agent lubricant that we're gonna to recommend to our patient? We know the complexity of the tear film. We're not trying to replicate it. What we're trying to do is to support it. And so I do argue in favor of multiple options for, for patients that require it. So if we're seeing inflammation and high evaporative stress, I might actually reach for uh, a category A and a category C solution. I do think that there's a lot more information to be gleaned from our artificial lubricants. And I certainly think that, you know, a, a call to manufacturers to share some of this information in terms of viscosity, in terms of molecular weight, in terms of pH, in terms of osmolarity of their solutions, so that we as clinicians can make smarter and smarter selection solutions, uh, selection, excuse me, instead of reaching into our drawer and grabbing the nearest sample. At this point, we really do want to raise the bar of uh, lubricant selection. Okay, so let's go on to the chronic patient now. The chronic patient will present typically of a more seasoned age group. This is my age group. I'm turning 45 in a few days. So I'm in this category here. I do also have dry eyes. So, you know, that's two for two right there. These patients may or may also not be contact lens wearers. And generally speaking, females uh, outpace the males in this category. Uh, their symptoms are typically more consistent. Again, mild symptoms, but definitely more consistent, as are their signs. So their signs are more obvious. Uh, corneal and conjunctival staining, if you're looking for it, will be found. That perilimbal or that superior bulbar area is an area to focus on uh, for conjunctival staining. Tear breakup is usually more obviously reduced, usually less than five seconds. If you have mybography in your office, you're very often going to see structural and morphological changes. And Osmo is more consistently over that 306 mark. Uh, and MMP9, if you're measuring it, is more likely to be positive. So these are the kind of the clinical features that you're going to see. Again, special attention to that superior bulbar region and extremely important to diagnostically express the meibomian glands of the inferior margin. Those are the easiest to access, the quickest to do. Um, but if you're just looking at the margin, looking for a plug, you're not doing it justice, okay? So this superior lid margin here, uh, excuse me, the superior conjunctival area, uh, as well as superior cornea, it is a goblet cell rich zone. This is where the goblet cells go to party and hopefully don't go to die. But if they are dying, you need to figure it out. Uh, and it's these cases where if I haven't measured MMP9, I'm certainly gonna reach for a uh, polysaccharide based uh, hyaluronate and uh, Trello is being one of those, one such uh, drop that I would reach for. It's also in these cases that I might be more inclined to reach for a steroid as well to calm it down quickly and very likely reach for an immunomodulator. Again, if you're looking quickly and you might be missing some symptoms, don't forget a ratin filter will reveal what you might be missing, okay? So the value of a ratin filter to enhance contrast cannot be underestimated. That may take a patient from looking like an episodic patient 
to an obvious chronic one. Okay. And so what about my, uh, my bone gland expression? So a lot of people kind of have this assumption that until it becomes toothpaste like in spissation, it's not true MGD. And that again, couldn't be further from the truth. What we're looking at in this video here is you're actually seeing the mybum that's being released and you're seeing tiny mybum spherules that have been released from the orifice. So I just palpated and we're just seeing it spread over. So my recommendation is after diagnostic expression, have the patient blink and blink a few times and really focus on the cornea. You're looking at the refractile nature of that tear film, looking for inconsistencies that may demonstrate precipitates. Even the smallest obstruction in that system uh, may represent a potential firm fixed obstruction. Looking at mybography, when we're analyzing these patients, it's important to identify features that are consistent with shortening of the gland, which may suggest obstruction. But one feature that's um, sometimes controversial is something called periductal fibrosis. So Steve Maskin, who invented the Maskin probes, uh, introductal probing has, again, been kind of circled around with controversy. Um, and I think the evidence is quite clear that it does have and serve a purpose. We look for evidence of periductal fibrosis, which is essentially a fibrotic band that may pinch either distal or proximal within the gland structure. And so what we're actually looking at in this image here is an example of that, right? We're seeing an area where the gland has been pinched off and that is resulting in a firm fixed obstruction. If you palpate this lid, the patient will likely wince and pull back. That's a feature of periductal obstruction. The only thing that will, will relieve that periductal obstruction or, or uh, fibrosis is uh, um, uh, introductal probing. No amount of IPL, lipoflow, radiofrequency is going to relieve that because it's a, uh, a dense band of scar tissue. So that requires probing. I will say though, probing is not something that I would recommend to do on every single patient. It does require some training uh, and comfort with, with doing it. It's a delicate procedure, but it does have a benefit. Finally, when analyzing my biography, the other thing to consider is which is better in these images, one or two. When I do this lecture in front of a live audience, I always ask which set of glands here would you prefer to have, better one or better two? Invariably, I get the majority of hands going up in the air saying better one, and I think the audience would probably suggest the same here. However, these images were taken a year apart and the length of the gland and the amount of truncation that we're seeing are identical. As it turns out, the image on the bottom just has more lid everted. It's also flatter. So we're seeing more tissue, which is not necessarily that it has been more atrophy. And it's this feature that I think we really need to be careful when we're discussing with our patients their findings of mybography, number one. And number two, we also need to be careful about the promise of gland rejuvenation. The evidence hasn't been clear in the least that gland rejuvenation is predictable or even possible. We have had reported anecdotal cases and I have had the same, but I think that may also reflect uh, a limitation of mybography in and of itself. We don't know what we don't know. We do know that infrared lighting will penetrate at different depths depending on the amount of water in a tissue, depending on the hyperemia, the pigmentation of a patient. There's a lot of variables that will affect the imaging quality and the response that we're getting, the signal that we're getting. So I always tell my docs that we're teaching and my students, you know, we do, I love to lean on it as an education tool. I don't like it as a marker of disease progression. So really, you know, kind of be objective and in, in, in monitoring your mybography. So let's bring it back to that chronic patient. How do we treat them? In office, eyelid hygiene. So these are patients where I'm gonna bring back for microblepher exfoliation. I love the zocular system. I'll talk about that in a moment, but it is a polysaccharide-based system, as you probably have figured out by now. I've given up my, my love for polysaccharides. Um, in the absence of zocular, there's still microblepher exfoliation rotary tools like Blefex or AB Max. Again, these are cases I mentioned uh, where immunomodulators do uh, make a lot of sense. These patients are in a chronic inflammatory spiral, so they're, they're likely going to need um, some regulation there through lifidograss or cyclosporine. In office treatments, whether they're thermal, radiofrequency, or light based treatments like IPL, I list IPL here because IPL is a very comprehensive tool. Uh, it exerts an anti inflammatory and a, thrombo, a photothrombolytic effect, as well as an anti infective or anti demodectal, antibacterial impact. Uh, and there is some evidence to suggest that there is a photo, photobiomodulatory effect as well. 
My protocol is typically a four treatment protocol. I'm not going into detail on photobiomodulation and, and IPL tonight. I really do want to focus on just big picture, um, giving you some practical tips. Um, but if you need more information on that, Dr. Laura Perriman is a wonderful resource. Try Master, if you look at her YouTube channel, she's got some great information there. Treatment pearls, we do want to be interventional in this uh, uh, approach, right? We want to take an interventional eyelid management approach. We do not want to be reactive. Uh, we know that dry eye is a multifactorial disease. It makes zero sense that it, we would have a, uh, a singular response, a silver bullet. We do need a multimodal approach to treating this and an interventional one at that. So a quick tidbit about zocular. Zocular is actually an okra extract. So okra is a vegetable. I love fried okra. Um, if you're from the West Indies, you'll know that. Um, but zocular is a polysaccharide. Okra, excuse me, is a, uh, exudes a, a polysaccharide that, ex that exerts an anti and an antibacterial effect. Um, but it's, it's more than that. As a polysaccharide, it can modulate the cell membrane at multiple channels. So whereas certain pharmaceutical agents will block a particular channel, like ICAM-1, uh, uh, for example, polysaccharides can modulate in real time in a dynamic capacity. So it's almost like a smart bomb, right? It actually acts on multiple channels, regulating uh, inflammation. And there actually have been studies demonstrating that a single zocular treatment, a zest treatment will reduce MMP9 statistically significant numbers and uh, will decrease contact lens discomfort in a statistically significant way. And there have been papers that I've listed below there that demonstrate that. So I'm very excited with zocular since I've been using it. Wonderful on soft tissue inflammation. As I mentioned, IPL, it's a great tool. You can see its impact on the left all the way to post-treatment on the right. Patient has a nice reduction in hyperemia, telangiectasia, uh, certainly an impact on their uh, uh, biomarkers, tear breakup time. Patient did very, very well. In short, what we're doing is we're exerting a photothrombolytic effect, a micro, uh, micro, uh, microbial control, excuse me, uh, biochemical impact. We're reducing that soft tissue inflammation, increasing uh, mybum consistency by decreasing the melting point of mybum. That's how it's achieved. Uh, and then there's that photobiomodulatory effect. Again, learning about it, there's a ton of resources, uh, a bunch of different protocols. I have my own um, that I've gleaned over the years, but there's a Rolanda Toyos, who's sort of the, the, the godfather, if you will, of IPL, Dr. Paraman, she does wonderful work too. So a lot of resources, look into it um, and uh, talk to people that have been using it. Finally, the recalcitrant patient. This is the patient who, if I, as I say it, you'll, you'll probably think of one or two of them off the top of your head. Uh, being in the institute that we are in, we do get a large number of these patients, unfortunately, um, and they are very recognizable. They are, they're, they're sort of an archetype. This patient may or may not be over 65, but generally they're of a, an older persuasion. Um, and they usually have comorbid diseases, systemic conditions like Sjogren's, rheumatoid, maybe they've had a history of surgery, uh, and multiple meds. Um, their symptom scores are certainly uh, uh, higher and more elevated in many cases, uh, unless they're of the, of the neurotrophic component, which I'll talk about in a minute. Their clinical signs are obvious. Most times they're very, very obvious. And so you're going to see things like filamentary keratitis, um, diffuse global staining, instant breakup time. Their mybomian glands are, are nubs or they're just squirting uh, um, toothpaste. So it's not necessarily a difficult thing to diagnose. Um, there are some caveats to that because the recalcitrant patient may be extremely symptomatic and have very obvious signs, but they also may have very obvious signs and poor symptoms, uh, sorry, and, and great symptoms. So those would be neurotrophic patients. So there's two different varieties here. And I guess the point to make here is that, you know, the signs that you're looking at may be severe, the symptoms may be severe, but these are patients where you really want to dive a little bit further into their mental health. And oftentimes that's where the answers lie. These are patients that typically have a high amount of anxiety and depression um, because of they've been living with this disease and it's affected and impacted their quality of life. So history, I would say in these cases is the most important data point that you're collecting. So what does the evidence say about this patient? Well, patient base, typically um, we know that the longer that dry eye or any chronic disease for that matter exists, the more impact it's going to have and the harder it's going to be to treat. With ocular surface disease, the more impact on the corneal nociceptive pathways 
uh, invariably this will contribute to an increasing gap between signs and symptoms. And that may be in both directions. So signs may increase and symptoms may go down in the neurotrophic patient, or signs may decrease and symptoms may go up in the neuropathic patient. And both of these can happen uh, for different reasons. Again, going back to the archetype, these patients typically have mental health uh, concerns are dealing with anxiety, depression, mood disorders, neuroticism. So I do think that it's important to tie in your other healthcare professionals that might be able to assist in pain management, mental health uh, management, because we are not psychologists, we're not pain doctors. We do need to know where our weaknesses and strengths are and lean into those. And where those strengths are is treating the ocular surface and treating the elements that contribute to pain if it's neuro neuropathic. Dr. Madan did a great job at uh, revisiting this at the last talk, um, blood biologics, so autologous serum and platelet-rich plasma. Um, and again, these are important features to consider. A challenge with some of these blood products uh, and is access. And in Canada, I can speak to that. Access isn't global. It's a little bit more challenging to come by. It is easier to obtain autologous serum than it is platelet-rich plasma or platelet-rich growth factor. Um, having said that, I know that in the United States, there are compounding services that will reach out to, to patients in their community and arrange for blood draws and preparation of these drops, which is wonderful. The key difference between autologous serum and platelet-rich is autologous serum, or ACET as I referred to it, is post-clotted blood. The blood is allowed to clot, separate it, and the serum is used to prepare the solution mixed with saline. With platelet-rich plasma, the clotting is prevented and the platelets are used in a particular high concentration of growth factors uh, after centrifuge. And so the difference essentially is that with platelet rich, you are getting a very concentrated uh, uh, solution of growth factors that is not diluted and that is activated. Whereas with autologous serum, you're getting a variable concentration of growth factors that is diluted. So there's a bit more known when it comes to platelet rich plasma. The challenge with both of them is that there is no consistent. Uh, preparation protocol and no consistent product that you can compare one to the other. So to be able to compare one to the other and to say that ACED or platelet rich is better than the other, at this point, because of the variability across um, uh, preparation techniques, it's, it's not really a well uh, studied or understood uh, method. Uh, that being said, there are studies that are undergoing right now. There's, there's one that was recently published um, that demonstrated the impact on multiple uh, chronic uh, ocular surface diseases, uh, the impact of PRGF uh, demonstrating a significant impact on reducing disease uh, severity across the board, in addition to symptom severity. There's also been evidence to support PRP for uh, neuropathic pain because it impacts the subbasal nerve plexus. And so for patients that have peripherally induced neuropathic pain, Obviously, scleral contact lenses may be an option, amniotic membrane may be an option, but it might be helpful to also think about including PRP for these patients. The pearl in these cases is really to set expectations. There's not going to be a silver bullet here. In fact, what we're looking in most of these cases of advanced complex disease is to try to slow down progression and hopefully to regain uh, uh, some function and improve quality of life. I always encourage pain management. And as I mentioned before, mental health management needs to be part of the puzzle uh, because ultimately these patients are going to have a bumpy road ahead. Uh, and it's not something that uh, we should be taking lightly. This is an example. This is actually one of my favorite patients who uh, actually passed away uh, not too long ago, about three weeks ago. And she showed up to my clinic uh, fortuitously on a day where the Raptors, that's right, the Toronto Raptors, won the NBA championships. And so I dubbed her the Raptor keratopathy patient because it really gave me that Raptor feel. Maybe I was just looking for it because I was all hyped up, but regardless, I saw claws tracking through and that looked like a Raptor to me. Uh, anyways, so she shows up, she's secondary Sjogren's, um, dense filamentary keratitis, aqueous deficient, meibomian gland dysfunction, rosacea, she had it. This was a patient where we started her on autologous serum, 40% QID, and followed her by managing, uh, sorry, by managing with autologous serum and complementing that with meibomian gland care using IPL uh, and uh, zocular for microblepharoxfoliation. 
So it took us about 120 days to get her to where she is, where she eventually would, would stay. But that rehabilitation, and I put it to her this way, this is going to take some rehab. That rehabilitation process was long and arduous, but we got through it. And we got through it because we set expectations up front. She did pass away last uh, uh, three weeks ago, and it was sad to see her, but she was at her best when it happened. And I guess the moral of that story is, you know, these patients that we're treating, particularly the recalcitrant ones, they lean on you heavily uh, and they become some of the most rewarding cases that you'll manage. And I, I can say that doing this for as long as I have, it, uh, it's never been more rewarding. The neuropathic patient, again, these patients have limited options. The evidence base is growing in terms of how we treat them. So we do have some limits. There are oral uh, meds that can be used. Low-dose naltrexone, I haven't listed it here, but low-dose naltrexone uh, is an opioid antagonist uh, that has been used. So dosing of 1.5 to 4 milligrams uh, per day for a month period, titering that up. Uh, in some patients, it's been, reused, it's been used in regenerative medicine, and there have been some uh, case reports and a small trial. Again, Rolando Toyas has done some work with this as well, demonstrating a 50% reduction in neuropathic symptoms in a cohort. I had a patient who was uh, post-chemo after uh, uh, being treated for lung cancer who was put on low-dose naltrexone for that. Ironically, this was a neuropathic patient previous. I assumed uh, post-cancer therapy, her dry symptoms and signs would worsen, but in fact, she got better. Uh, again, that was anecdotal. I've had a second patient uh, that has been on it for other reasons, and I am seeing similar improvements. There are limited data points to, to suggest that low-dose naltrexone is to be used, but it is a, an option that I think is worth researching and looking into um, because it may be helpful. In terms of development pipeline, uh, the cold thermoreceptors on the cornea, which are called tripmate receptors, are being uh, uh, targeted as a potential site for drug development. Um, so tripmate receptors may kind of hold a virtue in helping to reduce neuropathic pain and stimulating that neurosensory uh, component of the lacrimal functional unit. I think one of the things that I want to dispel here in terms of myths, you know, we think that pain patients need to always be a 10 out of 10 pain. And the more you treat this disease, the more you realize that there are many chronic patients who actually have a neuropathic component underlying it. And what happens is you treat the existing disease, you treat the glands, you treat their ocular surface, and you kind of tear away their signs, you get a nice clear cornea, and they're left with symptom scores of 20 out of 28, and you wonder what's going on. So never forget that neuropathy may underpin the very disease that you're treating. And the hallmark of that is chronicity. Okay. And so always keep in mind that uh, uh, anesthesiometry is a useful tool if you have access to it, but even in the absence of that, following their validated symptoms and looking for variances can be a feature and also looking at their mental health. Okay. So circling it all back, that episodic patient whose signs and symptoms are periodic, they're transient, and they tend to be exacerbated by environmental lifestyle and evaporative triggers. Uh, the chronic patient, their signs and symptoms are a bit more consistent. Uh, and they're typically underpinned by chronic inflammation. These patients are typically at some point episodic and they transition over to the chronic pathway. So our jobs as clinicians is to really identify them as soon as we can to prevent that transition. And certainly if they're in the chronic phase, they can catapult to the recalcitrant phase, which would be best to try to stop that from happening. The chronic patients, uh, 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 response to treatment is typically suboptimal. Um, and more often than not, their symptoms and signs are disproportionate. So these are the big buckets. And again, I want to reiterate that not every patient is going to fall into one of these three categories. But if you're looking at your dry patient base, if you're trying to understand it, when you go to clinic tomorrow, look for these patient archetypes and think about prevention. Think about tools to prevent them from escalating to the next phase. The other thing that's important is, like I said, that education piece. So it's one thing if I make a recommendation to a patient, particularly now we have a, an emerging uh, immense amount of treatment options that are all, you know, quote unquote, new. That new language to the ECP, to the doctor, imagine how new it is to the patient. So there are resources online. This is one in particular that's been developed in Canada. My colleague, Dr. Diana Nguyen, has developed this uh, blog 
And uh, actually, it's, a, it's an entire website resource for patients. But mydryeye.ca, there is a patient blog there, which has up-to-date evidence-based current articles that are very easily digestible for patients to understand. And more importantly, they're going to hear language that you're going to use in the office with them. So they're going to hear and read about things like IPL, like autologous serum. They're going to hear current therapies and current approaches rather than the patient coming in saying, look, my doctor told me to use baby shampoo and that should have worked. Why hasn't it? Right? So we need our patients to reflect the, the information that we're giving them. They need to be, it needs to be reflected back to them so they can interact with it. And we're developing a new language. This is a wonderful resource. I highly recommend pointing your patients to it. So I think we're getting into that sort of final couple of minutes here. Just remember that our patients are episodic and chronic for the most part. They make up about 80% of the practice. Um, we do need to take a interventional approach rather than a reactive one. Um, given that the disease itself is multifactorial, a multimodal approach makes the most sense. Um, and then finally, I didn't mention here as a concluding point, but smart selection of artificial lubricants is, uh, is where we're heading, right? So being able to just to do more than just grab the closest drop that's in the uh, drawer in front of you, we now have a paper that has analyzed a rheological profile uh, of uh, hyaluronate-based lubricants. We also now have evidence to suggest that polysaccharides may play a role in modulating inflammation. So we're, we're at a most exciting time when it comes to choosing a lubricant. And just because it's not a prescription agent does not, requ does not mean it requires any less input or clinical acumen to make that decision. In fact, I prescribe my lubricants as much as I prescribe my pharmaceuticals. So I'm very specific when I direct my uh, uh, patients to use a particular product. I'm extremely specific and I write it out for them. I print it out in a summary and I make sure they follow it. And finally, we always look for that silver bullet, but that silver bullet is looking right back at you in the mirror, buddy. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> um, is that silver bullet is very much the dry specialist. It's you, it's me, it's all of us. And we're all working towards a common end. So, so good luck. And, uh, you know, I can always be found on uh, IG at dry.i.jedi. And um, I really uh, hope that everybody takes a little bit of something tonight and, uh, and takes it back to their practices. And I'd love to hear any questions that you guys may have. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, that great presentation. It was so good. And your graphics were on point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.